Hello, and welcome to this video on anthropometry, which is one of the most useful tools in forensics when you lack a whole body, or only have bones to work with. The average human body has a series of measurements that are common to specific regions, phenotypes, and more, based on specific variables. This could be a Caucasian male is 1.8 meters high with blue eyes and blonde hair. It could be an African woman who has 1.6 meters dark skin and black hair. The skeleton of each is going to be very different. We're not just talking about hip width, but femur size, rib cage size, cranium, and more that are distinct to racial, ethnic, and cultural groups across a historical timeline. This means you can not only identify someone today, but go back throughout history and identify their origins and who they were going back centuries and possibly millennia. These differences have been categorized, listed, and calculated to within a narrow enough range that bones can be used to calculate a general measure of the whole body based on a sample from just a few intact bones. Anthropometry as we know it in forensics began in the 19th century with someone named Alphonse Bertillon. He was a Parisian police officer and biometrics researcher who kept hitting the same wall in criminal cases. He created a system to measure physical features in an effort to solve this. Although his system was later made obsolete due to consistency and reliability problems, it gave rise to what we see today. What would you do if you were walking your dog and came across a bag full of bones? Call the police? Hide it? Or let your dog run free with its new chew toys? That is what one British man had to ask himself in 2019 and there have been other cases across the world since. In ideal circumstances, he would have called the constabulary, would come to the site and begin by treating it as a crime scene. That is because some bones are far more like humans than others. For example, sheep have knuckles, just like a human hand. This matter would then be sent to a coroner. They would examine all the parts to determine the species to start with. If they were not advised initially that it was probably not human, then they would need to look at it as just that. If an animal, then it can be sent to someone better qualified to identify what has been found. In the case of a coroner or an anthropologist, they would be looking at it trying to figure out just what these bones are, who they would go to, and more. They do this by compiling all the bones, and we can begin to measure them. This is necessary to identify if anything does not add up. Are there too many or too few bones? Are some parts of another skeleton mixed in? Could it be parts from different skeletons all together? Each will need to be separated out, stacked up, and be able to then be counted and measured. Let's assume that they have a random assortment of bones. The first thing to look for are the obvious signs of pathology through bone deformities. Broken bones, bones that have not set right or healed correctly, osteoporosis, weak bones, more issues that are all signs of something unusual and need to be accounted for when providing other services. Shortly after this, you move on to the pelvic bones first. This is for one simple reason. They are the easiest way to tell whether or not it is a male or a female. In order to give birth, the female hips sit wider apart. After all, the child's head is not going to come out of a narrow space like in the male hip. Therefore, it must be wider to allow for this. This is obvious in the pubic arch and where the sacrum sits. There are also a variety of markers on the head. As you may or may not know, the male head sits slightly differently to the female head. It has heavier bones towards the front, which seem to be an evolutionary adaptation to violence. This is also true around the eye sockets in particular. Overall, the male's skull is larger and thicker than that of a female. They also seem to be more sharp-edged. The only problem with this is that what happens if what you found is a child, not an adult? Adults have reached a degree of maturity in all of their growth and adaptations. Once they hit that point, they don't tend to change. We tend not to find this phenomena in either prepubescent or pubescent children. This might owe to the simple nature of sexual dimorphism in humans. The necessary, and generally quite obvious, hormonal changes in a male and female add to certain features. Most of these are quite obvious in the skeleton, 
Males having a larger muscle mass than females tend to require more substantial skeletons for these muscles to hold onto, and also to compensate for that extra body weight. The nature of the female body and reproduction requires certain adaptations in that respect as well. And there are other changes which occur throughout puberty that aren't necessarily as obvious, but are specific to one sex or the other. Next we can begin to estimate just how tall the person was, how long their arms were, their legs, and so on. This is because over the years, anthropologists have been able to develop a series of formulas that can calculate just how big a person is, assuming various features. This includes different regions, backgrounds, cultures, and races, but for the most part, you only require a small selection of bones. This will give you a range of outcomes from this. You'll find that it's typically done in centimeters, and that owes to the fact that we use a civilized number system in science called the System Internationale. As a general rule, most of these formulae use the bones of the leg, these being the femur, tibia, and fibula. The reason these are used is that more often than not, they're intact, but not only are they intact, but taking the femur as an example, it can often be stronger than concrete. With that, you have long-term evidence that's not likely to break down as soon. That means the process of decomposing is likely to affect some of these bones lighter than others. And with that in mind, you can more effectively figure out just how big the person was. Next is age, and age is a bit more of a difficult question. Again, we have to go back to that whole maturation issue. Children under the age of 21 is very hard to do especially if you're missing the skull. The skull should have the teeth in it, and the teeth are what you would base the estimation of age on. Barring that, you can, to less effective but still effective levels, identify how old they are based on the growth or epiphyseal plates. Epiphyseal plates or epiphyseal lines are small markings in the bone. As the children get older, these begin to seal as the bones are no longer growing. This occurs somewhere around 16 or 17 for girls and 18 or 19 for boys. Once these are sealed, the bones are no longer growing, and depending on how much of it is sealed, you can begin to estimate just how old the child is. There are other bones that don't tend to seal off entirely until later in life, and this is why the more complete the skeleton, the better. One of these is the clavicle, and the clavicle doesn't completely seal until the age of 25. The other possible way to estimate this is simply to count the number of bones. Again, we need to be aware of the fact that you may not have a complete skeleton, which is yet another concern. We can, however, begin to estimate the approximate age, depending on how many and which of the 206 bones of the adult have fused, given that children have more bones that eventually reduce to this number. There's also latter considerations in life. The most obvious of these being arthritis. Arthritis can, to a certain degree, build up over age, and it should build up in a predictable manner. This means that if an older person dies, you can at least narrow down an age range based on the arthritis and degree of rounding and changes in the joints themselves. This is far less specific and far less reliable because you have to make an estimate and these estimates require extrapolating out results. So far, you can tell whether or not they're male or female, their approximate age, and something about their life based on some of the damage you've seen throughout their skeleton. If they've died very young or very old, whether or not certain bones are missing or damaged. This then leads to trying to figure out just who they were as far as their ancestry goes. With the bones, and depending on which bones you have, you can often begin to figure out some degree of ancestry for the person. As a general rule, there are three groups that, this, that are used for this. Caucasian or Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negroid. These being more or less European, Asian, and African. The problem here is that the features that are associated closely with each group are becoming more and more blurred. This owes simply to interracial marriage.
the interracial marriage leads to the mixing of these phenotypes across different groups, and it's becoming harder to identify just who would have particular landmarks on their skull as an example. Consider the maxilla. The maxilla should have three basic shapes, hyperbolic, parabolic, and rounded. Each of these belongs to the various groups, negroid, corpusoid, and mongoloid. If you were to try and measure these and the zygomatic arch, you would find that not all of them are going to reliably be replicated in your particular bone sample. This again owes to the fact that we are struggling with blurring of exactly what has defined these three. There are various programs that have been designed with this in mind and try to compensate by calculating the most likely match, but these still require being able to match a very uncertain sample to what should be a very certain set of data. We've mentioned that when we're looking at the remains, particularly bones, you'd be able to identify some degree of damage. Now, we need to be very careful in saying this as bone remodeling is only obvious for a certain period of time after damage occurs. Generally speaking, this is somewhere around seven years. That is, after seven years, you cannot see damage with your naked eye and must rely on technology to do so. This is also something to be mindful of when we're looking at remains. Primarily, whether or not the relationship between the damage you are observing, which is often called trauma, and the damage to the bones is related to a cause of death. In some cases, Death may have followed after a broken bone may not be associated with a broken bone, and similar. Anthropologists often don't work in this area, rather it's sent to a coroner. What's important to know is that there are three types of damage, that is anti-mortem, perimortem, and post-mortem. Now anti-mortem damage occurs before death, and this could be something to the effect of an elderly person had a fall, broke their hip, but died later on from something like influenza. And then you have perimortem, which could be damage associated with the time of death, and generally should be, and most often is the cause of death. Finally, there's postmortem, and this can often be a product of how the body was handled after the person had died. For example, foraging animals, attempts to dispose of the corpse, and so on. Of these three, only the anti-mortem should show signs of healing, and, depending on how long it has been, as we've discussed in other videos on trephination, you should be able to figure out just how long before the person died, the damage to the bone occurred. The perimortem damage to the bone should have had no chance to heal and should look very cleanly like damage. This is an interesting phenomena, and it's quite useful to see and understand when looking at possible damage and causes of death. You tend to get an equal degree of discoloration right across the damaged area once the person has died. This compares with the post-mortem, which should appear very brittle and will often break. This is because the post-mortem damage has already had the bone die off effectively, with the cells responsible for its recovery completely dead. That means any damage is damage that's occurred after it's been mineralized completely and there's no life left in it. You can think of the difference between the latter two as what would happen if you were to break a tree branch. The fibers of the tree branch keep it together, but it is very clearly broken. Whereas something like a soft stone, like sandstone, will break and crumble because there is absolutely nothing holding it together. Anthropometry is interesting and useful, particularly if, as mentioned, you either have an incomplete skeleton or you only have a skeleton. Based on this, you can, hopefully, find some uses for it. We've provided some useful calculator links and games in the description below if you're looking to explore this further. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.